Hello, hello. We have uh, now finished our first summary of the La Palma eruption, or our first write-up, and uh, we have submitted this for publication to Geology Today, which is a outreach journal, and it's um, uh, published under the umbrella of the Geological Society of London, and uh, the article will appear in the May issue. And we have put it on a preprint server so uh, people can actually start to look at it. And uh, it's not as beautifully formatted as the final version will be once it's printed, but you can get the information. And uh, I wanted to kind of uh, bring that to your attention. And in the box below, I will put the link to the preprint server where we have put it and you can actually download it there for free. And let me quickly run you through some of uh, the highlights of the article. So I'm gonna put this now here. And uh, what you see here is the uh, preprint uh, server's webpage, the Earth Archive. And uh, there you can download our work and here you can download the preprint. And I should say, of course, Juan Carlos is a main player here. And then James Day from Scripps, uh, Marichelle Alinas from Barcelona, uh, Vicente Soler, Francis Stegen, uh, and uh, Francisco uh, Perez Dorado, and Guillem Pinto. And uh, there's one person, uh, actually several persons here that are cut off. We have to go on this part here. So there's Esteban Gassel from uh, the US, and Alejandro Rodriguez Gonzalez from Las Palmas, and Helena Albert from Barcelona as well. And all of these people have helped and put this uh, together with uh, Juan Carlos and myself. And um, you can now download this. And uh, I've done this actually, and the downloaded article looks like this. So there's a cover page and there's a summary of the eruptive event, putting it into context, into a La Palma context. And we're also mentioning other historical eruptions here. And uh, we're trying to kind of frame the eruption within this geological continuum of eruptive activity on the island of La Palma. So we're offering this geological framework and uh, there's figures to go with it. So here we have the Cumbre Vieja Ridge and we are marking all the previous eruptions. Here's the 1646 eruption, here the 1585 eruption. And this is the new eruption, the 2021 uh, eruption. And there's an older one here. And uh, this is about 1480s, just before the Spanish conquest. And then there's the 1949 here. And in between them, we find the current eruption. So geologically, this is a very normal thing because it just follows the same pattern as previous eruptions. And the ridge is fed by dikes. And uh, these dikes, these sheet intrusions, they provide the magma for these vents that we see at the surface of the Cumbre Vieja. And um, here we see the Cumbre Vieja ridge in a side view. A perspective side view. Here's the old landslide scar, and this is the new eruption that has come down here, making two lava deltas. And here's the older 1949 lava delta, and then there are several older deltas here, 1712, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, the 1971 eruption is further out here. It's not in the image here, but uh, you get the idea. It would be in the little map down here. So, and uh, then we are discussing in our article um, the timeline of the eruption, and we are discussing the vents that have opened, and uh, also how much damage was done by the lavas and by the ash, and how much material was actually erupted. So all of this is discussed here. And then some specifics about the lava, how hot was the lava, what type of lava is it, et cetera, et cetera. So, and we illustrate this here with some images of the vents. This is a view from the west, and you see the sulfate crustings. This is actually a view from January this year, and then here, uh, this is a more close-up shot coming from the eastern side towards the uh, vents, and there's still the gassing going on. You can see a bit of blue haze in there. And uh, then, of course, as I said, we're discussing the ash, and the ash is a huge problem. A lot of pyroclastic material was erupted, and uh, there are some classic images here from San Nicolas, where the uh, uh, well, the goals were are kind of half buried here on the soccer pitch, and many of the houses here, the church square as well. And uh, some of the ash was uh, migrating all the way to um, Europe. And of course, also to the Caribbean, because the winds are dragging it over. So, and the aerosols, the sulfur aerosols, they would be transported this way as well. 
So then, of course, we're discussing the lavas here, and there was rivers of lava, and this was quite spectacular. There was also a lot of damage caused by the lava. Here is uh, uh, some photos from October, late October, and uh, this was something we witnessed, and it wasn't a very nice sight. Uh, here's a little house, and the lava was approaching it, and uh, well, we were standing there in shock and awe in a way of watching how the house was taken down. And it stood strong for quite some time, but it's eventually it collapsed in one big go. It was very intriguing to see that it's not a, a slow crumbling, it's a very quick collapse. And I think this was a rather, yeah, rather unpleasant learning experience. So here we have uh, La Laguna village and the lava uh, that has crept into the street. And now this is being cleared up right now. So this is a good thing. The road will hopefully be reopened very soon. And here we see a Kibuka. Kibuka is a Hawaiian term and it's a little island within lava flows. And here we see houses that have been flown, um, that has, where the lava has flown around. So they're sticking out as little islands of older material in a sea of lava. So, and uh, then coming back to the article, we um, discuss also the types of materials erupted here. So the lavas, how far they traveled and also what they're made of, the types of lavas, mostly they're basinites, but early in the eruption, there was tephrites. This is um, rock names that are meaningful to geologists for most uh, uh, people not so into geology or petrology, this is maybe a, a very subtle distinction only, but uh, the basinites have a lot of olive in the tephrites don't. And there was also these xenolith, these foreign fragments erupting, and I'll bring you back to the figures. So here's some thin sections, some microscope images, and uh, here the crystals have become larger with time. And uh, this is a TAS diagram, a total alkali silica diagram. And we see the old eruptions here, 1971, 1949, 1712, etc. And the new eruption that we plot here kind of falls into the same area. And the early eruptive material is the red here, and the purple is the later eruptive material. The xenoliths are quite intriguing because uh, there's two types, a gray type and a white type. The gray type plots up here, and there is some phonolithic rocks, some more evolved rocks on the island. And the uh, gray type seems to coincide with the most highly evolved phonolites. So our initial hypothesis is that these are picked up materials from the edifice of the volcano itself. The white ones, they are more intriguing, and there was a similar uh, occurrence of white materials erupting during the El Hierro eruption, and uh, they are rhyolitic. They are fundamentally different to the usual rock compositions on the island, So, and uh, they, um, they coincide, the ones from La Palma coincide with the ones from El Hierro. They are rhyolitic, and this is likely more of a continental thing. There's an African influence, and we believe that uh, at least as our main hypothesis right now, that these are sedimentary in origin, but these are fragments of the sedimentary pile under the island that was brought up during the eruption. Well, lava has to rise up and uh, then that's what it does. So it will interact with the rocks on the way that includes the sediments of the ocean crust, but of course also the island edifice. And here's just an impression. This is a lump of rock that was uh, brought up during the El Hierro eruption, and uh, we call them Xeno pumice, foreign pumice, because they have a texture like pumice, but they're not uh, native to the lava system, if you will, to the magma system. And uh, this is what we see now in uh, La Palma as well. So here we have a large white fragment of frothy material, and it's encased in this basinite material. And here's a pen for scale. So then we're talking a little bit about the earthquakes in our article and the seismic intensity. This is data from IGN. And uh, what we see here is that uh, there was initially some activity and then there is a kind of change towards the end. And uh, this is where most geologists were saying, oh, things are calming down because uh, yeah, there was a, a waning phase. And this initial pulse of uh, activity uh, in the earthquake in intensity and uh, the number of earthquakes was a good indication that the eruption will start. And uh, here we had a buildup of eruptive activity and then it was going down a little, going up, going down, going up, going down, going up. And 
eventually it waned. And this was, of course, a lot of um, stress for the population and the geologists at the same time, because each time there was a downwards trend, people were thinking, oh, it might come down now, it might end, but it didn't, it came back. So this was uh, this uh, up and down phenomenon that we experienced where people said, oh, it might be coming to an end soon, but it didn't. And uh, eventually it kind of subsided in uh, early to mid, uh, December and mid-December marked the final end of the eruptive activity and then of course it was declared at Christmas last year that the eruption is at least technically over but of course there's still some activity in terms of gas emissions etc. So also there was a ground deformation that comes from the volcanic material that's pushing up and we're describing this in our article and there's an uh, deformation image, it's a, it's a satellite image, and uh, this gives a sense of where most of, the def um, most of the deformation has occurred, and here's the eruptive site, and this is the area uh, where ground deformation has occurred, so this gives us a sense where the magma is actually residing at depth, and these data will help to calculate from where the magma is from. So the ash was very important, and uh, we're talking a little more about this here, so here you see the um, bloom of material and the wind was going to the south at this particular time when this photo was taken and this is an aerial photograph and you see that uh, the plume of ash is moving towards Funcaliente, uh, the uh, settlement and area, the municipality in the south of the island and here is the plume of ash and particles and gases and uh, we describe a little bit how this works and eventually there is this level where the wind takes over this buoyancy level and where the material is not rising anymore but it's transported away and depending on the wind strength and intensity and direction uh, we will have different um, directions into which and uh, distances into which the uh, ash is moved and we found ash on all the other islands uh, even in small quantities uh, on the most easterly kind of systems but most of the uh, wind direction was pushing towards the west and towards the northwest. So there was particle transport out into the ocean and all the way over to Central America and South America, in fact. So, and then we're discussing other pyroclastic phenomena like the rolling bombs, which was quite a shock and surprise. And uh, here we uh, have a picture of one of them, a spallation bomb, as we call it, because there was. Uh, shell material from the bomb spawning away and we can look into the glowing interior here. So the lava field and how it evolved is then discussed and here we have a timeline. The uh, lava thickness is quite remarkable. It's about 70 meters and uh, in, in, in the central parts in the yellow areas, it's very thick and then it, uh, it's thinner in the red areas. And uh, here we have marked in different colors how the lava field evolved over time. This is based on satellite imagery uh, from Copernicus, the European satellite system. And uh, this has been instrumental in uh, allowing us to say which areas will be affected or not. So then um, we are discussing the lava deltas a little bit. And here's an image of the northern lava delta, the smaller one. And this is from the southern lava delta. Here you see that the lavas have been cascading over the cliffs and uh, they have been spreading out at the base of the cliffs there. So uh, this is a, a bit of a mixed blessing on the one side, uh, the, the lavas didn't do much damage when they entered the sea, but to go there, uh, they need to go through a lot of banana plantation settlements, etc. So in the long run, these lava deltas might become useful either as uh, agricultural land or as a volcano park or maybe even um, to put settlements there. But um, at the moment, um, yeah, I think they are still off limits for most of the population because uh, there is still a lot of gas coming out and there's also lava tubes and things like that. So uh, the stability of the area is not yet fully assessed, I believe. So then uh, the lava field itself, here we see some images of the intensity and size of the lava field. And uh, the lava field is uh, thin at the edges, but quite thick in the middle, and it's still hot in the middle, several hundred degrees, I would assume, in the thick part, um, somewhere a few tens of meters down. And of course, at the edges, it interfered with the human world and with the uh, wildlife and the plant life of the island. 
So then uh, we're discussing the cleanup and the cleanup is intense, it's ongoing and people are coming partly back to the houses that are not destroyed, but it's a lot of effort. They will have to check the quality of the structures. They will have to check about gas pockets being in the basements, for example, and they're building these artificial mounds of ash where most of the ash is transported to for later use. And this is also something we discussed in the article, um, how much of it can actually be used in agriculture, in um, cement uh, as a supplement, as a supplement in roads, in, in, in tarmac to make, um, um, yeah, uh, new roads that are certainly needed and uh, certain infrastructural um, problems that have arisen from the lava flow. And that is one of the main arteries, road arteries of the island was truncated and uh, this will require a lot of building activity over the next little while and here the ash might actually come in handy strangely enough so um then uh, we are discussing a little bit about how good are we about uh, predicting things in the future and what is the remaining problems and Predictive um, geology is uh, making big strides. And here is some early predictions. That's the colorful part in the upper part of the image. And um, then we have um, in black, the outline of the real lava field. And there's a good match here. So this is very, very useful. Um, we can actually make some reasonable predictions and we can therefore uh, ensure people are evacuated and people are warned in time. The big problem is that um, people still lose their properties and this is a financial problem. And here, I think a lot of work is required in the future. And that is that uh, assessments are required where the property loss is assessed uh, in case of an eruption. And then insurances might need to step in and offer financial cover of those kind of situations. So there are some examples from various other kind of volcanoes. And we're given an example here from Santa Maria volcano in um, uh, Central America. And here uh, the uh, system describes the hazard zones that are marked in different colors with different hazards, lavas, ash, flood, um, uh, mud flows, etc. And the financial damage that would um, be inflicted if these things happen. And um, then uh, that would allow actually to by insurance cover, I would think. And insurances can protect themselves from um, 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 these hazards by making these assessments or by working together with researchers to have these assessments done. And given that the uh, loss of life uh, was virtually not existent apart from one accidental death in the exclusion zone. That means that the big challenges on the Canaries is uh, now to protect people from loss of property and loss, loss of their, their houses, their income sources and things like that. So this is gonna be the big challenge for the future. So, and um, here we're offering a little summary as well of previous eruptions of uh, the current eruptions the seismic precursor, the durations, and uh, this is hopefully gonna be useful for people to think a little bit about how eruptions in the Canaries might look like if there will be future ones in the next little while. There could be some on Tenerife, on El Hierro, on La Palma again. And of course, there was a historical eruption on Lanzarote, so that's a possibility as well. And uh, this gives us a little bit of a sense of what to expect if it comes to that. So um, this is our article and um, you can read the details here of what I've described. So, and uh, I'd like to say thank you to the Pevolka committee, the emergency committee that uh, has been instrumental in overseeing the uh, situation and uh, they gave us permission to go in the exclusion zone and work there. Then we got support from the fire brigade, from the military emergency unit, and from, of course, various other organizations, also the Guardia Civil and Las Palmas University. And I'd like to mention Wim, my friend on La Palma, who is a tour guide there, and he has also been very helpful. So thank you to all these people. And uh, as I said, you can download the article on uh, this kind of link, and I will put the link in the box here. And uh, you can then have a read, and hopefully you find this work useful. Thank you very much, and all the very best. And uh, I'll talk to you very soon again. Bye-bye.